welcome to the Pastured Pig Podcast, where we share the successes and challenges of raising pigs on pasture. We talk to producers all over the country, from small homesteads to large commercial pasture operations. Whether you're new to pastured pigs or have been raising hogs for decades, we hope you hear new ideas and new perspectives on pasturing hogs. Here's your host, Troy McClung. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another riveting episode of the Pastured Pig Podcast. I hope you find this podcast so interesting, uh, all the podcasts so interesting, that you nearly spill the feed bucket because you're not focusing on what you're doing. Now, I say nearly because I don't want you to get hurt or I don't want you to waste any feed. <laughs> but I hope it is entertaining for you and is the highlight of your pig chores if you listen to it while you're out and about. Anyway, enough of that. Let's move on to the announcements, and then we'll get directly into our discussion with our guest today. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say, and I say this with a little bit of joy and, and warmth in my heart, because I was actually able to get something done here in the last couple months, and that is making the Pastured Pig website live and functional. So if you get an opportunity, check out thepasturedpig.com. Don't forget the the in the front. So thepasturedpig.com. And you will see our new website. It is, um, it's like a little baby. It's just crawling. So um, we'll give it some time to grow and get some legs underneath it. But on the podcast, on the website, you'll see uh, that we have some blog articles. We have some, uh, we obviously have our podcast links. We have uh, the sign-up form for you can go and sign up to come on the podcast. We'll, we'll still keep that at both locations for a while. And we also have um, a page that has some resources, and I'd love to see that page grow with your all's help. And we'll have our business directory coming soon. You'll see uh, some placeholders for that, and, and that's... Um, that's, that I think is going to be one of the neater parts of the website. Um, anxious to get to there. If we can reach a certain funding level there on Patreon, then I can afford to turn that feature on. Um, but there's also uh, with the website, there's opportunities for you all to contribute. Should you, should you so desire, as I mentioned before, uh, you want this to be a community, uh, element that isn't just my voice. Uh, I, the podcast obviously is mostly my voice, but the guest as well. But the website, I'd love to have multiple inputs from people who raise pastured pigs all over the country. That way it's not just my perspective on things. So if you would like to contribute um, in the blog, you could even just send some images. If you don't feel comfortable writing, not sure you can do that, send me some images of your pigs on pasture, something that's pretty and and uh, that would get people's attention or, or make people... Want to pasture pigs, you know, kind of be a positive image there. If it's not a positive image, send it, and maybe we can use that in a blog article about, you know, maybe some of the downsides of pasturing pigs. And then also, as I mentioned, that resources page. Would love to know, what do you guys use as far as um, videos, as far as websites, books, uh, even uh, tools themselves? So, yeah, we'll start a section there where recommended tools that you use. And I'd love to see that resource page just grow and grow and grow. And that way it becomes uh, a benefit to all of us to go check out um, what's needed there for pastured pigs. Along the lines of support, uh, as I mentioned with Patreon, uh, that's how all of this is getting funded. Really appreciate all those supporters we have. As I mentioned, you know, several months ago, we met our first benchmark of 20 supporters, which allowed me to uh, build the website, pay for the hosting, all the things that go along with that, and able to get that live. If we get to 40, then we can I can buy the business directory element and manage it and turn it on, and then, of course, spend the time getting all of your all's information on there. So I think that will be very beneficial for a lot of us if we can get to 40. So if you've uh, thought about contributing and supporting, I'd love to have you now. Now would be a good time to get it going at the beginning of the year, and we can get set to hopefully reach that next goal. Also, along the same lines, because of uh, where we are with our with our Patreon, we uh, part of the step was also to turn on a Facebook group. So uh, I think a week maybe two weeks now. Goodness, everything's running together. I think two weeks ago, we launched the Pastured Pig Facebook group, and we have people joining and would love to have more uh, people on there and get some conversation going. We can talk about anything Pastured Pig, um, or we can talk about specific things around the podcast. Um, a lot of options there. Well, okay, well, let's get into our discussion. Today, we are going to take a slight trip south from West Virginia to Cabbage Branch Farm in South Central North Carolina. So let's jump in. 
today we are going to visit North Carolina at Cabbage Ranch Farms. We have Jennifer Hutchins on the line with us. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, thank you. Nice to be here. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. So um, let's jump right into this. So North Carolina, and is that, you know, such North Carolina has such an interesting topography. You go from uh, coastal, coastal Piedmont all the way up to the high mountains. Which side are you on? We are actually in south central North Carolina, 40 miles sort of southeast of Charlotte um, in Anson County. It is a little town called Wadesboro. We are about 30 minutes from the South Carolina state line. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So down in that area. Very good. Yeah. So so tell me a little bit about Cabbage Branch Farm. Give me the 40,000-foot elevation view of, of what you've got going on there. <laughs> okay. We uh, purchased this farm about three years ago. Um, it's about 29 acres. Um, it's a, The house was actually built in 1920. Um, it had sat empty for about 14 years, so there was a lot of work that needed to be done. We had zero fencing. Um, a lot of the pastures had grown up with saplings. Um, it does have an outdoor arena, which we, when we first purchased the property, we bought it for that because we had an equestrian center um, pre-COVID. Mm. <laughs> And uh, we moved here primarily to expand our equestrian center. Um, and I do a lot of teaching, well, did a lot of teaching at 4-H camps for horsemanship um, and had a lot of summer camps going on. And then COVID hit in March of 2020, and all of that stopped. Wow. Um, so we were just kind of looking at a way to, um, you know, provide a, a, food, a local food source because there's not really a lot of um, pastured pork in our area, um, and I grew up around pigs. My grandfather raised um, hogs, and I had a little bit of knowledge about pasturing them, um, but not on the farmer's market end. He basically sold, I mean, this was in 1980, so he sold a lot, you know, from the farm. People would show up, you know, and he would sell them a ham or a shoulder or, you know, a couple pounds of sausage. Yeah. So we reworked our fences and reworked a, a business plan and purchased some uh, Berkshires in October of last year. Hmm. And we took our first pigs to processing um, first of June in 2021, and it's been pretty wide open ever since. Wow. All right. So, so there's quite a few things there I want to back up and unpack. So first of all, <laughs> uh, if I had to guess, I'd say, did you grow up a little further south than where you are now? No, actually, I grew up about 30 minutes from here, so oh, okay. not too far. Okay, you, you sound like you a little bit more of a southern dialect that I'm picking I up do. on. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so three years ago, buying the property to expand the equestrian business that you had, and then, of course, mm -hmm. COVID happened. So I assume simply because of social distancing, the fact that you can't have kids there, uh, everybody's worried about right. exposure at that point, it, it, that came to a screeching halt then. Uh, a screeching halt and we had uh, 12 horses um, you know probably 30 uh, saddles tack horse trailers I mean we had a full operation and it just came to a screeching halt um, overnight yeah. I mean, it, it was pretty much overnight wow now so, so there's there's multiple questions I want to ask you if you don't mind about that so so that comes to a halt obviously that for a lot of us and, and, and my company was definitely in that situation as well you just you just wonder what's next what's what's tomorrow going to bring if if 90 percent or it sounds like for you 100 percent of your business has, has come to a screeching halt how did you how did you get from we can't train and teach people how to ride properly now let's Let's raise pigs. How did, how did you get to that? I know you talked about that a little bit, but you know, give us the genesis of that thought process. Um, well, just the food shortages. We've always had a garden. I've always been a canner and um, preserved, but just the food shortages and just not being able to, you know, find quality meat in our area. Hmm. And like I said, I grew up on a farm with pigs, so I was, was familiar with that. My husband was familiar with more of, of goats and horses he's never had pigs or been around um the pigs so you know we just kind of did some research and just found that for our property we have a lot of pasture area we have a creek um just a lot of places where pigs can be happy mm. um, 
and we just decided that, you know, we would take that leap and offer that service, you know, to have a local food source for pork, for quality pork, not just something you can buy at a store. Excellent. Yeah. So we just kind of, we went with the Berkshires. We actually have Berkshires and Durops now. So we have pure Berk, pure Durops, and then also a mixture of, of the half Berk, half Durops. Hmm. I like that. I like that mix. That's good. Yeah, I was looking on your Facebook page, and we'll uh, we'll post that information in the show notes so people can see it as well. But looking at some of your pictures okay. there, it looks like you've thrown some pretty good litters here recently. We've had we've got one more sow we're waiting to farrow, and she is just not wanting to. <laughs> she's just going to hold out to the end, <laughs> and it will be when I'm at the store or I run to the post office or yeah, you know, sometimes she knows that I am not going to be here. Or yeah, or in our situation, it's usually when it's. 38 degrees and raining is usually when that happens. Right. Us, but, yeah. And it's supposed to rain here tomorrow. So that would be an excellent time. Exactly. <laughs> yep. She'll fare. That's the way yep. it goes. So, uh, yep. so with, with what we're talking about, so you transition from equestrian into the pastured pigs. Let's first talk about infrastructure. So how much change did you have to make in uh, infrastructure on the farm? Was that, a, was that a huge investment? Were you guys creative in how you utilized what you had? Uh, did you divest of a lot of, I mean, were there, were the, was, the, was the farm full of horses and horse equipment and is no longer? Or do you still have a lot of horses hanging out? How, how does that work out? Well, um, I did sell some of our horses, but I've also leased some to other centers oh, that well. are closer to Charlotte. Yeah. Um, that have rebounded a lot faster than we would have. We're just in a rural area. Um, they're closer to Charlotte, and once the restrictions lifted, they had a little bit more flexibility than we had. Um, but as far as the infrastructure, the pasturing was a lot simpler for mm. pigs. Mm -hmm. um, they love the woods, so we, you know, we're very creative and very resourceful. With we did a lot of the cutting of the trees ourselves. We took the lumber to a local sawmill to have milled in the lumber for us to build farrowing sheds hmm. um, and repair what we had here. So years ago, I've been told, probably 50 or 60 years ago, the gentleman that owned this property also had pigs. Hmm. So um, we've kind of, you know, taken the property back to where it began at one point, but um, as far as the, the fencing, we, we had a lot of stuff already when we moved. We, we had 12 acres, and we took everything. We had fence posts because the people who bought our previous property um, were not into horses. So mm -hmm. we, were, we took it with us. We had panels, and we had um, T-posts, you know, a lot of wire. And so we brought that with us, and we've just kind of been resourceful. We find a lot of things at auctions. Um, you know, we'll go to an auction and there'll be a pile of tea posts, 150 tea posts for, you know, however much the bid goes for. So we just kind of, you know, we don't really don't buy anything brand new unless we absolutely have to. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. Well, good. Well, it sounds like that was a, a good adjustment. It sounds like you, in, in looking at the pre-screen information you sent me and what I've seen on the Facebook page, it sounds like you really kind of hit the ground running. Now, I assume... It, is it safe to assume? Let's let's put it that way. Is it safe to assume there was a, a certain sense of sense of urgency in getting the pastured pig operation up to producing some revenue simply because of the revenue loss with the equestrian business? A little. My husband is a full time truck driver, and mm -hmm. I I'm pretty much on the farm all the time. Um, and we have two children. They're both teenagers, so they they can pitch in and help. But there was a little bit of urgency just because um, we went we just stopped in our tracks. Mm. Um, you know, we just absolutely went from, you know, going wide open to nothing, to no income on my end. So there was a little bit of urgency, but I didn't want to rush it to, to where I wasn't producing a quality product. Um, it just kind of has all worked out, um, as far as, you know, getting a processing appointment, you know, finding quality feeder pigs to start with. It just kind of all worked out. Plus we had... You know, we had a trailer, a truck, fencing supplies, and we just had just kind of shifted gears, per mm -hmm. se. So Yeah, very good. So why did you land on the Berkshire Dura cross? Was that a was that just kind of what you're drawn to from what you'd read? Did you have from familiar with it in your in your past? So that's what you liked when you were when your grandfather was raising pigs, or is that just what you had feeders available? 
Well, I, I, he always had Duroc, so mm. I'm, I've always been around Duroc, and I've never really been around a Berkshire. Um, I had the opportunity to, to go look at some feeder pigs, and I had done my research and just, you know, read about the, the feet uh, fat to meat ratio and the marbling, and I was just really intrigued and just started out with that, um, and got a Berkshire sow um, from a farm in South Carolina. So, and he's actually done very well for us so far. So, yeah, he, um, yeah. So, so what do you have right now? You, you, it sounds like you've got a, at least a multiple, uh, multiple sows, uh, multiple breeding sets. What, what do you have as far as the line of your, your genetics go? We have, currently we have four breeding sows, one um, boar. We have four younger breeding sows that have just been weaned. We purchased them probably a month ago. And then we have about five feeders now that are going to be ready March or April. So they've just been weaned. Plus we have our additional litters that were just born this past week. So a lot of them have been spoken for and some of them, you know, will just remain feeders here for later in the year. Yeah. So, next year. so am I doing my math right? So that's eight, eight sows you have. You have the younger ones and you have the ones that are more established. Yeah. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and being serviced by the one boar. Right. Yeah, and you said that... We would like to add another boar, um, maybe on, you know, further down the road, maybe in the spring. Yeah, I'll say, come to West Virginia. I've got two you can have. <laughs> <laughs> we might. Yeah, yeah, I've got two, two too many. All right, uh, so, so wait, that's... that's So that's that guy has a pretty good... That has a pretty good turn pretty quickly. So it sounds like... Um, X amount feeders, X amount selling um, uh, for people to, to raise themselves. Do you have a percentage in mind you're trying to do or just kind of seeing what the market will bear right now? Um, for the feeders or for selling? Uh, for both, yeah. What's the ratio you're looking to do there to grow out your own uh, growers, I guess? I, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at maybe 75% to keep and a little bit to, you know, like 25% to sell just to kind of supplement. Um, but if the market, we've started doing the Charlotte farmers market, which is one of the state farmers markets, and we've done really well with that. Um, so that may change with demand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Good. I was going to say, I was gonna say I, you know, when you post pictures of baby pigs on Facebook, everybody says, oh, I want a baby pig. <laughs> right. um, you know, you get a lot of that. And then it's time for weaning and, hey, come pick up your pig. And, it's, you know, there's crickets. Right. So, <laughs> so I don't know. I've had a lot of people say, oh, they're so cute. I would love to have one. And, um, you know, I've got several that are spoken for, but we're going to keep you know, at least 75 percent of, of what we have this year. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I want to, uh, a little bit further down the road, I want to talk to you about the, the farmer's market and, and some of the intricacies of a market of that size. But uh, we'll get to that here in a second, if that's okay. So yeah. so let's talk about um, a l just a little bit more details of your infrastructure. So it sounds like, uh, of course, in, in South Carolina, you've got the luxury of having some rolling to flat land. So that gives you some freedom there with that 29 acres. But um, how have you set up your pastures? Do you have a rotational process? Do you have, uh, are you doing a wagon wheel? Do you have a specific farrowing area? Do you farrow on pasture? How, how are you addressing all those things? Um, we have, we do rotate. We rotate about every five weeks, six weeks. We have four separate pastures. Um, um, I had talked to a friend of mine who actually sells beef probably about 30 minutes from me and they had done it before and I thought that you know it's only it's about an hour and 15 minute drive um it it is definitely busy I mean it's one of the like I said one of the state farmers markets mm -hmm. and it is it starts at eight o'clock in the morning and it probably does not slow down till one in the afternoon I mean mm -hmm. it is just constant people but we do cuts. I haven't done the, the holes or halves yet. I've had a few inquiries about that, and we may reach out and do that next year if the process or appointments, you know, will allow that. Things yeah. are kind of tight with with the process or having enough staff to do, you know, they put a lot of products on hold, like, you know, some of the smoke things, right. bone broth, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, but I've so far it's, it's been really, well, you know, we've done really well and I've really enjoyed it. 
Huh. Yeah, that that's great, and and I can definitely understand the processing woes. I think that's the ongoing theme. That should have been the um, yeah. sub theme of the podcast for the last uh, sixteen months, really. So yeah. yeah. So with the cuts, are you is is North Carolina a state inspected option as well? So do you have state inspected and USDA options when it comes to cuts? Yeah, it's both. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now being that close to the South Carolina border, are you are, do you just do exclusive USDA or do you still do state inspected? It's both. We just we can't sell over state line. Yeah. But in the, our processor is also USDA. Oh, okay. So you've got the option to go in and say we want these processed for interstate sales and these maybe processed for not, and just choose if you wanted to. Yeah, we could. I don't know uh, the meat handler's license. I'm not sure how. I haven't really looked into over the um, over state line sales. I've had a few people ask about shipping it, but um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've looked into the cost of that and having to store dry ice and get these styrofoam coolers, and I just don't know that that's something that I want to deal with right now. Right, yeah, that's interesting. One of these days we're going to have to get somebody on here that's doing a lot of shipping. It, it seems to be just an evolution of, of pastured uh, pastured pork and, and quite a few other things, but right. it just just you know wonder about the sustainability model of that, and it, it to me it kind of takes away a little bit of of local ag when you're shipping stuff right. across the state or even across the country. But uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Well, all right. So so with the farmers market in North Carolina, so that in, in Charlotte, so I, yeah, I'm familiar with that one. I know that one is massive. So a how did how did you get in? Is my understanding there's usually a, a waiting list with that, and and b were there a lot of hoops to jump through? Did you have to meet a lot of requirements? Is the upfront cost? Do you have a lot of booth expense? How's that How's that penciling out for you? Um, the setup actually was really easy. The the personnel at this farmers market are super helpful, really mm-hmm. nice. I called, you know, kind of explained what I did. There was no waiting list hmm. for wow. a meat processor. Oh, okay. It was only for um, things that you did that a farm did not produce, like if you were um, selling wholesale items or things like that. Oh, yeah. So um, I got an appointment within a week. I went and met with the director. She gave me a tour. It, the meeting did last about two and a half hours. You know, you go through the what to do, what not to do. There was no cost in the beginning, and booth rental is $15 per sa- per Saturday, and that includes a table and a parking space right <laughs> at the booth where you can unload. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that. Holy moly. <laughs> There's an ATM in each covered shed. Each covered shed has a restroom. I mean, it's perfect. Oh, I mean, I'm, that's, yeah. It's the best deal around for fifteen dollars. Well, I, well, again, uh, get me started about my local ag department, but that just shows you that <laughs> that North Carolina is embracing the farmer to have a to have a setup that large and to keep those booth costs at that is is just fantastic. I mean, what a what a great way. I mean, you, you're 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 meeting overhead in the first twenty minutes of your Saturday. Uh, even right. probably by the time you factor in your marketing and your actual uh, your components in the booth, you're probably meeting that in the first half hour or within the hour at least. So, yeah, that's that's right. excellent. So that obviously... I did, a, I did a farmer's market local, uh, one of the first ones, and they wanted $50 for a booth rent for four hours. And I was like, uh, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I just could, yeah, and a lot of them are like that. You have to... To pay a, an upfront fee, and then you have to pay an ongoing fee. So this is for the money. It's the best deal for us. Oh yeah, our our farmers market in the capital city, and it's it's in a urban renewal area, so it's kind of a little uppity, but. Yeah, I, th- I think the last time I checked, the booth rental was a hundred bucks, and you had to have a commitment. You just couldn't come in and do a one weekend, and you had to do these. So a lot of these these farmers that are trying to do veg realized, yeah, I can't sell a a. A, a, you know, an ear of corn or, or five years of corn for a buck and be able to cover my booth fee. So what a lot of them ended up doing was phasing out the veg and bringing in uh, like consumer flowers, petunias. It seemed like every single booth was somebody selling different types of flowers they could sell for $20 a pot. And it kind of defeated the whole purpose of the farmer's market. It wasn't fresh produce right. at that point. So, well, great. That, uh, yeah, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And obviously it kind of kicks the legs out for some of my other questions about how you manage the time that it takes to operate a farmer's market and weigh that against uh, profitability. But it sounds like as busy as that market is, as low as your overhead is, then it's really your labor that's only factoring into that. And that takes, sounds like that pencils out pretty quickly. 
Mm-hmm. And when you have two two teenage kids, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I need this school to practice this, and I need this school to practice this. Yeah. They provide one table. You know, I really just take a chair and probably a fan. Oh, and you have a, a power outlet. Yeah. Um, and if you wanted that same booth every month and you wanted to keep like a freezer there, you can. You have to, I think she said it was a hundred dollars a month and i may be wrong on that but Mm -hmm. you can also you know bring a freezer and leave it there and you can just have a a storefront a permanent type storefront every month yeah wow Um, but yeah it's it's awesome we love it very good very good well that sounds like that's going to be a good opportunity for you uh to have that resource there and and definitely justify that uh, that expense and trip there uh, to get that much of a captive audience, and I guess, you know, my goodness, I, I think of uh, we did a um, we did a podcast episode. Actually, it was one of the the Patreon episodes talking about profitability and setting up farmers market booths and things you got to look at. But with again, with that low overhead, the ability to do customer retention, customer um, acquisition at that point really, really makes a lot of sense at that point. That's that's good stuff. Right. Yeah, North Carolina has really done well with the state farmers market. I mean, I think there's three. I think there's Raleigh, one in Asheville, and then Charlotte. So they have really, you know, it's a really good program they have going. Very good. Very good. So let's let's talk about, let's go kind of go in in two key categories here. Let's talk about long-term and short-term goals. And let's start with short-term short-term goals first, if I can talk. So what <laughs> what are your short-term goals with Pasture Pigs? Knowing that you, you've been at it a year, but you've had some really good growth already. You've got some good success. Sounds like your genetics are getting lined out. What, what's the next couple years look like uh, for your farm? Um, I would like to add um, maybe a few more structures for um, – like maybe a farm store is one of the things I'm, I'm looking to, to do, to have its own structure with freezers, you know, and not, in, not anything, you know, elaborate, but some type of storefront um, where someone could come here to purchase items. And, you know, it's, it's just for our pastured pork or produce or, or other items that we have. That's what I would like to work on. Um, Obviously, I'd like to maybe get a few more boars, um, expand our herd, and incorporate a few more markets if possible. Yeah, yeah. So do you see in that in, in that growth, or first of all, let's talk about that farm store. So I assume your farm location has a, 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 a decent community element around it. There's some decent traffic where, where um, farm visits make sense. It is. We are in the country. We're, you know, we are, we don't even have a Walmart in our county. So we, we are, we're out there, but we do have Charlotte close by. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people like to spend the day and come out and see where their food comes from, see how these pigs live, um, you know, see that they're out eating acorns and roots and grubs and, you know, they can walk around a 15 acre pasture and do what they want. Yeah. You know, they can get muddy and, you know, they're just living that good old pig life. So um, we do have that option. Now, is it close by? We do have a lot of people that are close, but I'm banking on, you know, Charlotte and surrounding areas to mm-hmm. come for probably our farm store. Yeah, and that would be an interesting experiment as as a marketing data guy. That the data always fascinates me. That'd be an interesting experiment in the next. Let's say you get your retail store up and running there on the farm, and, and just penciling out how profitability works out between that and the farmers market. Now, granted, the farmers market is probably going to gross a whole lot more, but the freedoms right. that you get on having the on farm store, uh, it's just how that works out. It would be neat to see that comparison over time. Right. So. So what about um, what about long term goals? What? Uh, well, actually, yeah. Let me, let me go back to the short term goals. So uh, there was a question just kept coming back in my head here. I wanted to ask you: Do you see? Uh, do you ever see equestrian business coming back to your farm at some point, or is that kind of a chapter you've you've closed permanently? Um, I think since we have the arena, I think we are open to you know hosting some events, livestock shows, maybe some sow. Um, hmm. or pig shows, yeah, very good. Sales, maybe 4-H clubs. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I, I would be open to some, but I, honestly, I really love and enjoy the the pork end of this and dealing with the you know the farmers markets and you know making a product 
the quality product that tastes good and people will call and say, man, that is the best bacon I have ever had. Yeah. You know, I've got to have some more. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, I, I just, I just enjoy that. I enjoy, um, not that I didn't the equestrian end, but it just, you know, life changed and we've kind of adapted and overcome and, you know, we're just going to keep doing this and maybe we'll go back to it Yeah, eventually. But right now I think it's, it's just going to be the pigs. Yeah. 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 I have to, I have to be careful. I want to be sensitive to your, to your hobby. I, I, I have a general disdain for horses. We always, we always called them hay, bur- <laughs> hay burners up here, but. Uh. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a lot of expense there. Right. There is, you know, a lot of, very little profit. Right. Right. But they're, they are the majestic animal. My goodness. And there's nothing prettier than a horse farm. It seems like, now I think maybe that's what it is in West Virginia. When you go to Kentucky over in the bluegrass state and you see these big horse farms, uh, you just think, well, that's, that's kind of uppity. I just, I just no way I could compete with that. <laughs> yeah. Every time I drive by one, I'm thinking there is no way these people are making money. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> That's what I think because yeah. I've been there and I'm like, there ain't no way these people are making a profit. Right. Yeah. Just the board fence alone kills me. I'm like, oh my goodness, how much yeah. lumber is in that? Very good. Right. Well, uh, well, what about long term? And this this is a little bit harder question. So we talked about the the on farm store. We talked about maybe some expanded locations in the next several years. But what about five to seven years down the road? Do you see this growing to to just keep growing and growing and growing, or do you do you have a potential ceiling? We say, okay, this is where I'd like to to stop and just really do this well. Or have you put that much uh, thought into it yet? Um, I would like to see it. I don't want to get too big and I don't want to get to the point where I'm, I'm feeling frantic or hectic. Eventually I would like for my husband to come off the road Mm. and to also be here as well. Um, You know, I don't know that that will be a reality with the way, you know, benefits and insurance and healthcare is, but that's my long-term goal is I would like to be for him to be here to help with the day-to-day things and, you know, to get him more involved. Well, don't let him get off the road until all this shortage stuff gets figured out. (laughs) (laughs) I know. He texts me every Saturday about 10 o'clock. How's it going? How's it going? Are you busy? Are you busy? And he just loves to hear numbers. (laughs) He's a numbers guy. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Good for him. Very good. Yeah. I I would assume at at some point growth is going to be a little restricted by, by the amount of, of acreage that you have, but is, is that something you see possibly an expansion of your farm? Do, are you look, would, would you, are you looking at larger property or expanding property, neighboring property? Um, I, I don't know because this, like I said, this was really grown up when we moved here. There was a lot of work involved and 30 acres, you know, 28, 30 acres is a pretty good number for us to manage on our own. Yeah. Uh, he would like that. There is some adjoining property, and he has mentioned that a few times. But all I see is, wow, that needs fencing. This needs work. <laughs> there's no water. There's no driveway. There's, you know, I'm happy with what we have, you know, because it's manageable. Right. I think, um, you know, more than that, he would have to be here and come off the road and be on a tractor um, doing some mowing, some fencing, and, you know, figuring out why isn't this fence charging? You know, why is this pig walking through this part? Or, sure. you know, we'd have to have him here for, for that. So, so is he up to that? Is he, is he ready to come off the road as much as you want him to? And, and is he kind of, is he a guy that gets in with the pigs and, and does that kind of stuff already? Uh, honestly, I think he's a little intimidated by them. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. like I said, he, he grew up around horses and goats and, I'll get in there and, you know, I'm the one that kind of, they follow me. I'm the food lady. Right. Um, and he just kind of stands there like, I'm glad you're doing that <laughs> <laughs> because they are big. Um, and our boar, thank goodness, he's very docile and we've raised him from weaning. So, you know, uh, he's not harmless. At all. I mean, he's just pretty much a big baby. Sure. But that can change. And, you know, I, I know that, but he, um, I think he's open to it, but, he also enjoys his job. He's been there for several years, so yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Well, I think he would appreciate. I'm sure he's been stepped on by a horse, and being stepped on by a pig doesn't hurt as much, at least in my experience, as getting stepped on by a no, horse. But it doesn't, and it's and you know they're knee high, so or waist high, so it's 
when you have a horse and they're over your head, that's a little bit more intimidating. Exactly. Exactly. Well, great. Well, before I ask you the closing question, I ask everybody, I have to ask you an additional closing question because you'll have some uh, you know, specific, unique insight into this. So who has a better personality, a pig or a horse? Oh, my goodness. That is a good question. <laughs> I'm going to have to say, you know, and I've had, I taught riding lessons for 25 years, and I'm going to have to say a pig. Ah, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I, I, knew I it. am going to have, because these pigs, I'm telling you, and my husband might think I'm crazy. They know their name. They know my schedule. They know what I'm doing. They know what's in my hand. I mean, they, they're pretty smart, and yeah. they, each one is different. And horses are too, but like, I think the pig has more personality. Yeah, see, I think, and that's, that's the dirty little lie, I think, about horses. It's just all about the marketing. It's, horses just right. have good marketing. So everyone thinks a horse is, there's great movies about horses. There's, there's just all of this, this uh, pop culture about horses. And, and so I think that's why they get the better rap, that, that, that they have. That, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that and then there's reality. You know, there's, <laughs> there's vet bills, there's uh, yeah. barrier bills, there's feed bills, there's show bills, or you know. I know, and, and, and everybody would frown off you, or frown on you if one day you decided, I'm just going to go ahead and eat the horse. Yeah, it just, it just doesn't go over yeah. as well as when you decide to eat the pig. So. Right, because when you're going to eat the pig, they're like, oh, sign me up. I'll, I'll be there for that. <laughs> <Exactly>. yeah, <laughs> when, you, when are you taking that up? <laughs> exactly. You say you eat the horse, people right. look at you like you're a monster. So what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, that's good. I appreciate that. Let me have a little bit of fun there. Okay, Jennifer, so closing question. So what is your best experience or your favorite part about raising pigs on pasture so far? I just, I enjoy them being in their element. I enjoy watching them out there rooting around, you know, eating those acorns and grubs and just living the life. I just, I enjoy watching them. I, I spend most of the time outdoors. Of course, I'm always doing something, cleaning the water or filling up a feeder or something, but I, I have to say, just watching them be pigs, and you know they are just built to be in the pasture and be outside, and they just they just kind of make the best of it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt that it is definitely there's something something therapeutic about just sitting back and watching a pig do what pigs do. That's right, absolutely. All right, well, how can if people want to learn more about your farm, how can they find you online? We are currently working on a website, um, but for now, we're on Facebook. It's under Cabbage Branch Farm. Mm -hmm. You can just do a search. We're the only Cabbage Branch Farm that I know of. We're actually named a creek that uh, runs through our property. It's called Cabbage Branch. Oh, okay. So that's how we came up with the name. So gotcha. um, just search Cabbage Branch Farm. Um, and like I said, a website is coming, but I'm slow at getting all that together, and I am Pretty much, I'm an uh, '80s child, so I don't know a lot about <laughs> how to do this, that, and the other. So, yeah. um, it's coming. I understand. I understand. Yeah, I'm looking at your Facebook page now. You've got a lot of great, great pictures of your pigs on pasture there. Some, some really good imagery. So, y'all, listen. Be sure to check that out and see what she has going on there. Well, Jennifer, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. It was a pleasure speaking with you today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. You have a great week. Take care. Well, I really appreciate Jennifer taking the time to come on the podcast. Be sure to check out the information to her farm down in the show description. And also be sure to check out the website, check out the Facebook page, check out all kinds of stuff. Uh, we'll have uh, links down in the show description. Well, I appreciate everybody listening. I pray you have a great week out in the pasture. Take care. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Pastured Pig Podcast. To learn more about our podcast or to submit topics or recommend guests for future episodes, visit redtoolhouse.com.